Welcome to the Paradise Paradox. Crazy ideas for open-minded people. So I'm just here in Coimbra in Portugal for a few days, passing through on my mystical journey. And yesterday I had a chance to interview Michael Nimitz. He's an expatriate. He's been living in Acapulco for a few years now. After the first Acapulco conference, I think he decided to go down there. Also, he's joined by his friend, MC Elemental. So we talked about a lot of things, talking about a workshop or the principles of Michael's method with communication and how communication can be improved within organizations to find the needs of individuals better met so people can get together and improve in efficiency. And of course, being in Acapulco, it's kind of a hot topic right now, the tragic death of John Galton. So we discussed that and how dangerous Acapulco is in Michael and Elemental's experience. Also talk about Elemental's music, of course, it's performing down there at the Turtle Party and a whole bunch of other interesting stuff. So it's pretty cool. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for liking on Facebook and subscribing on YouTube and staying cool. Let's get into it. last night so he's just getting the uh just kind of getting the initial first day of acapulco we yeah. had the organized and everything and getting ready yeah okay good so you're going to be performing there uh i'm going to be performing at the turtle party uh that has become an official anarchapoco event i performed there last year uh with a couple of other mcs it was one of the best parts about coming down here last year i freaking loved it and uh yeah, the street credit of that event is off the map, so I really feel like it's going to be very successful again this year. Um, mm -hmm. We're also going to be doing our t-shirts there. Uh, we made a organic, uh, unbleached, herbal dye or low-impact low high dye uh, anarchic cocoa shirt with a custom logo from our Steemit design contest. You can see it there. Oh, cool. And we also got a, another logo on the background. Now, the, the one on the front is from a, uh, my Steemit, the first and second place design from the contest. Uh, merged yeah. together to a new custom logo, and oh. the third. Not coming up so clear on the camera. Make you send me an image later. Yeah, just send me a picture. And there's a state of anarchy logo on the back. That was the third place design with the alpha and omega there, creating a new. Ah, that's cool. So yeah, we're just uh, providing some uh, healthy and eco-conscious options for clothing this year. Um, they're all the shirts we got to are from uh, WRAP certified factory, fair trade, all organic. So yeah, we're really excited to offer these to people as a, a, a healthy alternative for clothing. Yeah, that's really cool. So about your music, what what kind of? I mean, you do hip hop, obviously, but what's uh, what do you rap about? Uh, we do conscious revolutionary hip hop. So mm -hmm. we uh, kind of focus around uh, just the topics that are gonna create positive evolution for mankind and the earth. Hmm. My style in particular, I use a lot of abstraction, a lot of metaphor, um, yeah. try to make people about what I'm saying more, you know? <clears throat> I just uh, actually just finished recording a new song called Shift the Focus. I'm waiting for my buddy to tell me the mix down over right now. Got a rough mix Shift down. Focus. Yeah. yeah I'm cool. hoping to perform that one the turtle party too. So, All right, great. Yeah, like I was like I was saying, the, that last turtle party on the beach there was where I I really saw the brilliance of what he's got. I'm not a big rap aficionado by any means, although uh, Kirk's song is one of my favorites, by the way. And, <laughs> but uh, you definitely caught my attention last week or last year. You got some real talent, man. So, Thanks, I appreciate that. So that's why he's you know we met last year and now we're you know like best buddies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we just uh, recently, back in November, um, Elias Clay came to Portland. Where I'm from Oregon. That's where I live. Um, mm -hmm. But we, uh, she was on our Constellations tour, and we helped her do a big show in Portland at this place called the Geodesic Art Collective. 
it was really successful. We had a great time, and uh, we have plans to uh, record a music video down here, actually, while we're down here uh, with with the State of ARP. They're going to be recording it. Um, uh, the, the, the track's not quite done yet. I finished the, the first part of it, and then Wyatt has got part her part of it, and we're splitting the last verse, so it should be done soon. Hopefully in time to get the music to get <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, Michael already heard that set that we recorded the other day in Leeds. I'm still trying to put together a, a video for it. So I have some footage in there, and then I, I want to put some speeches with some positive messages uh, in there as well. So I'm still working on that. Hope, hope to get it out before Anacapulco starts. <laughs> Definitely, you know, we'll definitely be playing your music. We'll be playing his music. Yeah, great. You know, it's definitely going to get out there. You're on Steam in a lot yeah. of different, in a lot of different ways. You've got a bunch of different things on Steam. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, yeah, I'm uh, Elemental on Steam. It. That's E L A Mental, and uh, that's my MC name too. So I'm a part of Tribe Steam Up. Um, my buddy uh, Kenny Palantano or Kenny's Kitchen on Steam. It. He uh, started that group, and um, yeah, it's, it was a crazy ride, um, and it's still going on now. You know, there's been a lot of uh, things happening with Steam that's causing people to not uh, be active on it uh, recently. Um, so we, our communities kind of aren't as big as they used to be. Um, mm -hmm. But when they were at its peak, there were so many people that wanted to be in Tribe Steam Up that qualified to be in the group, but we just didn't have room. So I created a, another account called Earth Tribe that was originally designed to be affiliate account of Tribe Steam Up so we can include more membership and still have support from Tribe Steam Up to Earth Tribe in some degree. And it was working really well. Um, but when we lost the bigger delegation um, to Tribe Steam Up, it kind of made it so it didn't really, it really couldn't be supported by Tribe Steam Up anymore. So uh, one of my intentions coming down here is to kind of rebuild Earth Tribe on its own and really extend it further than just Steam It. I mean, I, I chose the word words Earth Tribe for a reason that can move a lot. Uh, further than just one platform, you know, and mm. that's another thing. I want to make some Earth Tribe shirts too. If they're coming up in the next six months. Um, yeah, cool. And my mind was a bit blown when Steam at first came out because I was like, oh, "This is, you know, it changes everything." Like people, artists all over the world are going to get money and they're going to have resources to do cool stuff and everything. And yeah, as you're saying, it goes it goes beyond that. The kind of communities that. Are, developing from it yeah there was a i don't know if you know about steam silver gold i don't think so i guess last year was the first year 2017 uh and then 2018 this past year um they made what's called steam silver rounds i should have grabbed one before i came in here um i brought some down here but they're community designed silver rounds um that have the steam logo on them and on the other side there's a they so they have a contest each year for these and mm -hmm. all these different artists uh, submit their entries in the community votes each week um, and one one design gets eliminated each week until there's only one left and the one that's left ends up being the reverse design on the coin. Um, so the last one was really cool. The guy uh, I voted for actually won, Welsh Stacker. Um, it's just this awesome tree that says community on it and all through the tree there's like fish and whales and stuff in the in, instead of fruit in the tree. It's really cool. The community in a bunch of different languages around the circle. So that's another thing that's been going on in Steam too that I don't think really a whole lot of people even know about. So I'm definitely excited to offer the 2018 Steam Silver Rounds down here in Acapulco for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it brings a few ideas together. Yeah, and it's a great way to cash out your Steam earnings too if you want to. Uh, if you know you're into cashing out some of your Steam, uh, I definitely cashed out some of mine uh, on Steam Silver Rounds when Steam was at like. It was like at four dollars and thirty cents at the time, I think. So I feel like I got really good value on those. Yes. And, uh, hopefully, in the future, we'll see that price of steam again. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go back up to four bucks. Well, actually, that's a question that uh, maybe we can ask you, Kurt. Uh, mm -hmm. You seem to have a great deal more success in steam as time has gone on. Than, uh, than a lot of other people. I mean, it seems like the trend with your your Steam presence has gone in the opposite direction of most people. <laughs> well, sort of, sort of, because it's kind of sneaky. What I, uh, I mean, what I do is I, I use bots on there. So I, prom I promote 
my post very heavily because I just want to get the visibility. So I, I put a couple of hundred dollars onto the, the bots and then they get to the front page or on the trending and hot and then, and people see them and then, you know, other people see it and maybe they like it and get some engagement and stuff like that. So, I, I mean, I still make a bit of money from it sometimes, but uh, mainly it's looking at getting promotion, like getting, getting visibility for my videos and things. Mm. Yeah, well, I think you're certainly doing a hell of a job. I mean, this, Thank this, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, the cryptonomics uh, show that you do, I, I really don't miss that one because, you know, you've had a lot of great interviews and, and you really brought up a lot of good topics, you know, that Thank you. most don't want to really, you know, maybe acknowledge. It's kind of like this is the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> and you're able to address those things. So I, that's, uh, I think that uh, I think that comes across. And I think that's another reason that I think you're successful is that you're, you know, you're touching on subjects that I don't think a lot of people are touching on. Yeah. Well, well, but I think it's necessary. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, I try to, I think a lot of people have this assumption that spirituality and money don't really mix, but I think they, they absolutely do. And there's so many spiritual lessons that you can learn and emotional lessons that come up when you're dealing with money. Uh, and you know what is the proper use of money how can you use money to enrich your life and other people's lives that's so important yeah it's, it, it's well money is just another tool right yes <laughs> money can be not corrupted like it is now mm. I mean, we have a high inflation rate on most of our world currencies and it's causing us to be economic slaves and in some mm. cases so you know we can develop currencies that are fair for the masses. And that's really what we need, is something that's going to be solid and fair for everybody and equal, really. I mean, because this, this uneven distribution of wealth across the world is causing most of the problems that we have economically, uh, environmentally, and, 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 and uh, for humans in general. So Yes. It's so like the incentives are all upside down. So we've got to build something new and try to correct that. <laughs> Yeah, but don't, I mean, uh, just a general kind of statement in regard to that. Don't you feel like, you know, what is going on? Why the, why the people at the top are amassing and hoarding all the wealth is essentially because of the same reason that they're, they're, you know, they're, they're reaping what they sow, which is fear. And, you know, they're just, they're fearing the masses more. And so they're like preparing themselves by trying to hoard all the, all the valuable stuff. And I think that's what we're seeing, you know, but the, the problem is, is that they can't hoard the most valuable thing, which is our mind, you know, <laughs> if we use it. Yeah. Well, they've tried to hoard our minds for a long time with ma controlling the mainstream media and everything and uh, Project Mockingbird and all, all these things, but yeah, can't last forever. Yeah, well, they, you know, they, they've learned how to take advantage of people's weaknesses and, you know, human weaknesses to, you know, take advantage of that. But the reality is, is if we know what our weaknesses are, hmm. we're more than likely not going to be able to be taken advantage of with that. We've gone through a period of time where, you know, with all the conditioning and certainly even the new technology, a lot of that stuff is... Is in the same manner taking advantage of people's weaknesses, but that doesn't need to be the case. And certainly, the more that we, you know, bring people's awareness up of what they're capable of, what their potential is, and you know, recognizing their weakness, hmm. they they can uh, they can improve. And I think we yeah. all can. Yeah. The powers that be, the one percent, I think honestly, are starting to become afraid of the power of the ninety-nine because <laughs> we're we're far along now in the age of information, and more and more people are slowly waking up. Maybe not so slowly anymore. I've noticed a lot more people like like coming to terms with the fact with the way things are, as opposed to the way that they they see things. You know, mm. and uh, 
that's what we need. We need more people that aren't woke enough to wake up. And we can only help the people that are ready to hear it, are ready to listen, are ready to wake up. You know, I've tried to, there's some people in my life recently that I've tried to convince of certain things in relation to conscious uh, evolution. And, you know, some people just don't want to hear it. And there's literally nothing you can do or say to them to make them hear it. They just have yeah. to hear it in their own mind. That might mean that they never will. But I feel like a lot more people are starting to listen. And yeah. that's a big right direction for humanity and the earth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what was that? Literally nothing you can do in regard to changing people's minds that are actually is. Certain and people's is, minds, just people who can't aren't ready to hear it. Well, I think what you need to do is go back to understanding what motivates people and what people are interested in and being able to uh, facilitate them understanding how to find out what they really want. Now, I think that's one of the things that, uh, and this is kind of what I wanted to talk to Kurt about in regard to, uh, you know, some of the workshops and the work that I'm doing, <clears throat> is uh, I'm kind of testing out a little method. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using like uh, seven volunteers to essentially go through this method and see if it works. And these are people that, you know, like you're talking about, people that you know, have been in my life, practically my whole life, and in some cases, or have been in my, whole, in my life, my whole life, but, uh, you know, have really not been able to understand where I'm coming from mm -hmm. with, you know, my ethical conduct and the things that I, I feel are important. And now we're starting to get on the same page as far as, you know, understanding where our real voice is. And, um, you know, just in the uh, initial stages of all this, I'm seeing some, you know, tremendous movement that, uh, you know, I've been working on that problem since like Ron Paul 2007, where I'm trying to convince people to vote for Ron Paul and they're going, no way, he's never been, you know. And it's like, uh, you, know, you just put a wall up. Yeah, how do I move beyond that? Now I think I've I figured it out. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. It's a very <laughs> difficult thing to figure out, especially with stubborn people who are obsessed with greed and money and really don't care about anything else. That's kind of the people I was referencing because there's kind yeah. of people in my life that they're just they talk about a brick wall. Whoo! You can't get through it sometimes. <laughs> and if you found a way to see through the crevices of those walls and start breaking them down, that's awesome. You know, I'm all for that. Yeah, well, there's a couple, there's a one thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, one one thing about that is with this, uh, the people who seem really stubborn. I think there's like people people who talk a lot about this stuff, and and people who are who are stubborn on the other side. And in the middle, there's all these bunch of people who haven't yet taken a side. And so I think it's always it's always closer to. Uh, things opening up a lot than it appears. I do think there's there's a lot more potential than we realize. Our society has been conditioned in so many ways that, you know, what we think is reality, you know, in, in regard to society is, is a contrived idea, you know, that's essentially been controlled and conditioned into our mind. And, you know, we've sustained a great deal of conditioning not just with the institutions, but also the media, and then even all the technology, you know, the, the social media and the way that it's designed. There's a, there's a great book, it's called The Hacking of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes into kind of this, uh, kind of the story of like, you know, how sugar kind of entered into the diet oh. and how it's, it's, it's basically a confusion between pleasure versus happiness. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a substitute for happiness, you know, in regards to pleasure, but it's like an addictive substance. You know? Yeah. And so then as you take it, it sounds more addictive than cocaine. You end up <laughs> you end up kind of stuck in a loop where you gotta have more to get the same feeling, but then that feeling kind of dissipates. Mm -hmm. And then you come down and you're like going through roller coaster like depression situation. And in the end, in all these addictive type of situations, you end up more unhappy and, and depressed because you just can't keep getting more. It's just a downward loop. 
And the thing is, is for the marketing people and for the people that are selling things, it's better because they're always promising happiness. It just doesn't, it's not just food though. It's, you know, like Facebook with the likes, they're a substitute for happiness. You know, they're a substitute for people connecting in reality. And so you end up more unhappy. And I think there's studies that kind of show that Facebook and all these social medias actually make you more unhappy. And so we've just got to recognize that. And so again, I think it's like, you know, it's like being able to kind of make people aware of what their weaknesses are. And then also like what kind of things are, what they really want, what they hope, what are motivated to them. And then, and then contrive, you know, and then kind of adjusting the message to fit what works for them. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember the author, but he's a, he's a doctor that had a, probably about 10 years of talking about how sugar is destroying the American health, you know, in, in general. But I think it's gone all over the world. So, I mean, you know, you know how sugar is kind of proliferating around the world as, uh, you know, the, the products, the processed products seem to be just moving everywhere. I don't know, Kurt, you probably have a lot more experience in that area as far as seeing what kind of processed products are infiltrating kind of the third world markets and stuff. Well, I do have a lot of experience with sugar. It's probably my biggest vice. <laughs> but yeah, you know, obviously people love sugar all over the world. Yeah. The way our societies are set up, we live in a world that where profit is number one. So, you know, your companies want to sell something that's more addictive because it sells better. That's the bottom line. And sugar is super addictive. So there's sugar in almost like every product now not every food product but you know a lot of me when i'm in the united states you have a slice of bread and even the bread is sweet and it's weird yeah i know there's the hawaiian rolls <laughs> you, ever, you ever seen those no how do those work um and it's just a super sugar loaded type of bread that they're selling <laughs> you at the hawaiian rolls <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you, you, you came last night. You, you, weren't you saying you were like went into the, or hold it, you, you said last year you came and you went into the Walmart and you were like, wow, people are thin here. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm saying that? Uh, was that Mike? Yeah, I was probably Michael. I don't know who's trying to get drunk. I was talking about my new Michael. <laughs> 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 But yeah, you know, Mexico and, and I think a lot of the third world, the people are still skinny for the most part, you know. But mm. and like at Coca-Cola and all these sugary products get more infiltrated into the system that more and pe- more and more people are becoming obese. Yeah, it's a big problem. I mean, that, I gave up drinking soda like almost 10 years ago, and I'm so glad I did. It made me feel like shit all the time. I mean... You know, and that was the same thing for cigarettes too, really, uh, in a different way. But um, but with soda, like a lot of those, can, like a can of soda, like nine out of ten of them, the amount of sugar that's in the can can't even physically fit into the can in solid form. You literally have to liquefy it. Like I mean, if you look at like a can of Mountain Dew, I think it does like forty six grams of sugar. Can you picture how much forty six grams of sugar looks like, and then see if that would fit in the can? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, it looks that. like seven yeah. teaspoons or something. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, like, go buy the Oreos. It's just all sugar. The whole thing is sugar. Like, you know what I mean? It's like there's tons of products like this. And we have an obesity <laughs> issue in, in, the, in the United States. And then in many other countries, people are starving to death. It makes no sense. People say that we don't have enough resources to distribute. We have an overpopulation problem. No, we have a resource distribution problem. That is the problem. We don't. We have plenty of resources to go around. It's just not fairly and evenly distributed amongst the people, so that everyone gets all the nutrients they need to live a happy, healthy life, which isn't fair. And that's probably one of the biggest things we have to face. Yeah, that's that's another entrepreneurial uh, opportunity. I mean, that's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity. You know that uh, that you know we need to get people on. I mean, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of interest. I mean, I can see how excited you are about it. It, it 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 just makes sense. That that's another element of of kind of the uh, of 
what I'm talking about in regards to my method. And I'm not saying my method is like, the, you know, from God or something, and this is the way it needs to be done. It, it's very flexible because it's essentially, you know, uh, uh, harnessing what people want. And, and uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that when you do something that's ethical, you can rally people around that. You know, when it's good, people rally around what's good. And that's, you know, the, the system creates substitutes for what is good. You know, when they say, hey, we need to protect our country. We need to build the wall. We need to do this. It's good for our country. You know, they're, they're using that ethical, you know, draw. Hmm. But it's a lot, you know. And that's the difference. Is, and, and that's the thing with, you know, this kind of sugar analogy is all these things, all the news, all the social media, all the, the movies and the, the TV shows, they're all the same thing. They're all filled with like sugar for the mind that, that essentially, you know, keeps us in like our animal mind state. And like after our basic needs, rather than actually using our head to figure out how to solve problems. And letting our spirit flourish instead of worrying always about what body needs. Sometimes we listen to what spirit needs. And oh, actually, the way society design suppresses that from us. So. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's one of the reasons that I think, you know, both you, Kurt, and, and Elemental here, you know, you're you're speaking to, like, the heart when you're using the music and the, the vibes. And, the, you know, you're kind of putting people in a, in a state of, like, accepting, you know, the message. Yep. <clears throat> and I think that's, you know, that's a, a, a real combination. And that's, that's why, you know, like I, I really want to work. I want to collaborate with people, you know, and work together because when we work together and, you know, we also kind of expose each other's weaknesses and, and we can help each other with those. So let, let's talk you know, a little more in detail about the, the method. So you send it, you and seven people. So is it based on an, on an octolog? This is something that I discovered a few years ago and it's, it's an element of, you know, what I would call the superpower groups, which is uh, four parts of my method. And the last one is what I call superpower groups. Uh, but you could also call it kind of uh, the role of the pieces, there, which is, is that like when you get people together, uh, you know, and certainly in our society, we're seeing that like when you have two differing opinions, and you have two people arguing in the one side or the other, they really never end up hearing the other side. They just kind of talk about their side and they never really listen to the, to the other side. Well, that's kind of the role of the third person is to like offer a third perspective hmm. that essentially then, you know, that, that kind of demonstrates that there's a third option, you know, hmm. that people would get out of the dichotomy. It's not always A or B. <clears throat> and so then, you know, like, is, you know, in relation to the octolog, essentially the octolog is just a recognition that eight people at, that are equally distributed, male and female, are, and, and have ethical, uh, have an ethical agreement, are the most creative unit that you can have. I mean, they've essentially done the studies, done the work on that. But to get there, you really need to start with, like, this idea of the third person, adding the third person, and, and essentially taking on the role of the third person. But then how do you get to being, like, a good third person? Well, that's, that's the other three things, and that's uh, what I call the first is essentially just journaling, where you're, like, writing stuff down. But... What that really is doing for you is is uh, paying attention to your inner voice and kind of getting, and I'm sure you guys, both of you guys can talk about like how like writing music, and writing your feelings down ends up like really getting you to think about, is that something I want or is that something that someone else has told me, you know, and, and getting into that discovery is certainly something that journaling does. And if you look at, you know, all the studies on journaling, you see just a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, positive benefits. 
But then going from that is the, the second step is uh, is meaningful communication, talking to another person, and you go beyond the small talk and you start talking big talk, things that are actually meaningful to both sides. You know, and uh, there's a there's a uh, a uh, TED talk that's I think called Big Talk. And it's like a little 20 minute thing about, you know, this lady asking people on the street about like, you know, if they had one day to live, what would they do? Well, you see like a transformation of people from just being like just kind of automatons to actually like thinking about what they would do and who they would talk to and how meaningful that would be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's the thing. How do you teach people to like. Turn that on, you know, to, to be able to say, listen, I, I need to talk to you in a meaningful way. You know, let's let's cut the baloney. Let's let's talk to each other, you know. Yeah, my friend Link gave me an, an interesting example about that. So Link is kind of he's living a monastic lifestyle. And he told me he was with a group of friends and somebody brought up some interesting YouTube article that they'd seen about how the trees in a jungle kind of work together. So the, the taller trees try to spread their leaves out so that the shrubs and stuff can get enough light. And he was like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Do you think that means they're friends? Do you think that means they love each other? <laughs> and then he got into asking his friends, well, what is love? And all of a sudden is having this very deep, conversations just based on this interesting scientific fact. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and I, we were discussing this as well, I, I think there's a, uh, you know, a real benefit from understanding that as we get into harmony with each other, things improve. And it's also the environment. When we get into harmony with the environment, it's like magic happens, you know, hmm. and, and we can, can do that it's it's certainly within our capability to do that but we've we've got to be willing to do that which means we've got to know what everybody needs everybody wants you know i feel like for the environmentally the environmental part at least like it's kind of our responsibility as uh custodians of the earth to be in harmony with the environment you know we've totally neglected that responsibility it's now the responsibility to mend that and uh I think that's something that needs to be focused on a lot more. But as I was discussing with you last night, I'm, I'm really encouraged by a lot of the projects I've been seeing lately. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the videos of uh, these trash cleanup machines that are self-powered, going through the ocean, picking up trash on their own, like tons of trash. Every day now they're making more and more of them. Uh, I, I don't know much about Elon Musk, but I heard that he released all of his uh, patents for the electric cars to be public for all car companies, so that all mm. car companies now compete with him. And, not, and stop, essentially stop making fossil fuel uh, combustible engine cars. I mean, you know, so with all the negative stuff going on in the world, there is a, uh, um, a counterbalance to that coming forward. And mm -hmm. it's really encouraging for, for conscious people like us because, you know, it's easy to get uh, to get down about everything when you see so many negative things happening all around you. When people around you in your personal life are, uh, you know, not caring about any of this stuff still and so then you hear about some of the bigger names and bigger projects happening that are really you know making a big difference on the planet it's just really important. yeah but uh, you know one of the things in regard to the method and certainly some of the things that are going on in acapulco you know and, and, and really in the rest of the world and it, it's kind of derived from my experience in construction is the idea of like peer-to-peer -peer. How do, you, how do you make it so that people understand that they bring value, you know, and that their like recognition of the value that they bring is, is, is really valuable. And, and I learned this through you know, doing construction projects where I instilled this kind of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, methodology. I didn't really know it was peer-to-peer -peer at the moment. I just thought, you know, I, I'm coming from, uh, you know, a background where I was in the military and I saw like, you know, the, the harms of uh, hierarchy, you know, in regard to, you know, not being able to get 
the most out of people because there's one person that's in charge. <clears throat> and so the rest suffer because that one person doesn't have the perspective of, of knowing what all the, all the rest of those people have to offer. You know? <clears throat> and so when I did this in construction project, I was able to just like blow it out in all kinds of different ways. And over my whole career, I was able to apply it in different forms, whether it be building houses or building apartment buildings or building factories or building airports and, and leading, you know, people that have, you know, less than a high school degree versus people that are, you know, well-educated architects and engineers. In all of those cases, it all applied to the same thing. When people understood that they, they brought something of value and, and they matter to the rest of us. <clears throat> Magic stuff happened. So, like in my first uh, one example is, uh, you know, I, I put together this construction development project for an apartment building, and our delivery schedule was like 24 months. I felt like uh, with the new technology, and I'm and I, I was coming out of college. I had some computer knowledge on computer scheduling and throwing like new things at the industry, I thought, well, I can make an impact. I can cut this, this uh, schedule down to 18 months. The thing was that I started actually like explaining to the, you know, the crews of people on the job site about how to work together. Mm. And they started working together. You know, we started having a peaceful environment where people could actually like communicate with each other instead of being hostile with each other. And that turned into like magic, you know, because my schedule went from like 24 months, we actually delivered the project in 11 months. And that was with a whole lot of different hardships that is unforeseen. But the thing was, is when people started working together and they started really getting it, then, just, then stuff just started magically happen. People started talking to each other and saying, hey, can you help me here? I'll help you there if you can do this. And next thing you know, things are just, you know, just happening. And, uh, you know, uh, not only did it decrease the schedule, everybody ended up ahead, you know, because they were more productive. They could, you know, they could, you know, going forward on new projects, they basically had an edge because they understood how to how to make it work better for themselves. You know? Right, I understood yeah. the other parts of the company or other people's roles better, and how to right. communicate with them, and yeah, so many things. Yeah, yeah. And, and so like we, I had a situation where like we would have lunch once a week. Where uh, at first I started a sponsorship. Where I would basically buy everybody's lunch if we'd all get together, and then I would make some kind of announcement or presentation. But as people started to realize what that was, then I had like the subcontractors actually like bidding to have that time, so they would be paying for lunch, so they could explain to the rest of the job site like what they're doing and how the rest of them could help them do their job better. You know, so that they understood that, you know, like, okay, we're doing this and you don't want to put the bricks in front of the door of the, of the building that I'm, you know, trying to install the plumbing in and stuff like that. You know, so then when people started to understand each other, then they realized that it's like an information thing, you know. It's just like when you get the information out in front of the rest of the people and they understand what you need, then holy cow. You know, then they can do what they need, and, and you know, then it starts becoming an exchange of information. Yeah. So, uh, this is kind of where I wanted to tie in the whole uh, crypto thing. Is, is that that's the kind of thing that, uh, in regard to construction, I, I foresee the whole smart contract changing everything in that in that field. You know, so it, it's a. I, I believe you could probably cut the cost of construction even in the most modern projects by 50% with an application of, of smart contracts to construction. What I was getting to when I, I got off on the tangent here is that I saw a conflict in the, in the job site hmm. and I was able to alleviate that conflict between the different parties. And when I was able to get them to 
understand that like a peaceful environment is much more productive then that's when things started happening and, and then i you know and now i'm looking at the world and i'm seeing all the different things that are going on and i see all this conflict you know and i think oh well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as the construction project, you know, but people just don't understand because they've been so inundated with thinking that conflict and competition are the only way things can get done in the world. You know? mm. there, there are other options. And really, like when you get to a peaceful situation, you're just kind of like raising the bar to a whole new potential that. Uh, you know, I, I, I call it like, like the hierarchy is really kind of like this first gear mentality. You know, like if you had a car and you couldn't get it out of first gear, it's, it's value to you is really kind of limited. But our society is kind of stuck in first gear because it allows us to be controllable. But we're giving up that potential to like shift it into second or third or fourth. And we've had so much conditioning, we don't even know that we can shift it into second or third or fourth. You know? And and that's kind of the barrier that we've got to get beyond, but it means understanding how much value a peaceful, a peaceful environment is, you know, to actually like respect each other enough to like be at peace with each other is just this incredible thing you know this incredible new awareness that has really been kind of hidden from so you said there's four four parts so there's the journaling and then the meaningful meaningful communication and what are the other two the third one is is what i call feeding deep and this is really kind of from my anarchopoco experience of like meeting other people and them bringing uh, you know, like what their talents and what their abilities and what their passions are into, you know, into my awareness. And that is, is that like all of us have the ability to like dig deep and really find who we really are and then bring that forward, you know, for the rest of, for the rest of us to know. And this is kind of my, what I would call, uh, you know, I guess it's like a tribute to the people of Anarchapoco is that I, I recognize everybody has got some really valuable talents and passions and, and stuff that that you know that it may not speak to me, but it, it might speak to you know ten of my friends. Yeah. And and if I don't know that, then I'm never going to be able to put those two two things together. Mm. You know, but as as I as I get to the point that uh, you know, I'm seeing the value that you guys are bringing, you know, specifically YouTube in this case, you know, it, it just, it's like, oh man, like when, if we can collaborate, you know, if I can help you get to a bigger audience, if I can help you, you know, do whatever it is that you really want to do. If, if, if I can do something that, that makes it easier for you, uh, that's magic, you know? And we can do that. We can do that day and night, and we can do that with a hundred people. Uh, you know, th there's there's another thing that's I think it's called the Dunham number or the Durham number, which is that uh, like you can hold like 150 uh, relationships, valuable or ah, yes. good relationships, and and that's another part of this is kind of the idea that you want to build your tribe. Know, that 150 people around you as people that know who you are and the values and the, you know and the, and the abilities and the skills that you have and also like the opportunities that you're looking for if you have 150 people around you that really knew what you need what you're looking for and what kind of opportunities are out there i i, I almost guarantee you you're going to be gold you know, your life will be a pleasure to live, you know? and and that's that's kind of what this uh, this third idea this digging deep is is that like when you meaningfully communicate with people sometimes they're going to give you new information that you're going to have to go back and say 
is that true? Is that who I am? You know, like their perspective is different than mine. Who who is right? Or are we both right? Or are we both wrong? You know, that's that's the digging deep thing, and, and that you know that involves a lot of different things and a lot of different people. And certainly, our community of people has explored that in a lot of different directions. And and we just need to be aware of all those things. You know, which person speaks to me, and what you know. Let's follow up with that. You know? mm. And then the final thing is, like I talked about before, is a superpower group, uh, which uh, to me is just like if you if you've got a purpose and you really want to accomplish it, uh, this is the way to go about doing it the most successfully. Because and I've been doing research for about two and a half years and looking into all the different studies about. You know what works for humans how people get into a flow state all these different kinds of things and this is what the superpower group is about is is like recognizing how valuable other people are their skills plugging into yours and how that really gets things rolling you know, we've we've been told, we've been conditioned to believe that there's a there's a way to get things done, and you know, there's all these self help books and you know, talking about how to improve ourselves as individuals. Well, that's wonderful, but we've also got to realize that there's also some other strengths that you know involve other people, yeah, and, and they, they can bring things to us that it's almost like magic. So that, that kind of uh, roundabout describes uh, the method. Okay. Yeah, well, it, it is a something I was thinking about the other day because some, somebody told me that you want to be successful in, well, the example was show business, but they said you need two of three things as money, talent, and a network. And I'm like, well, I guess I have some of those things, but I don't know really how to use my network or how, how do I help people that I know and how do I ask for help from people that I know? It's, it's not the easiest thing to do. So do, do you have any ideas? Like what are the okay. practical? I would say that, uh, and this is another thing about, uh, you know, what I've been able to find is in regard to how do we learn the best? You know, the, and the best way to learn is is to teach other people hmm. what do you what do you teach other people the, the perfect thing to teach other people is like what you bring hmm. and then and then teach them to, to to do the same thing to you you know teach teach people how to teach you how to how to deliver what they want you know and in so doing you end up learning a hell of a lot faster than, you know, like, uh, you know, I think there's the uh, the pyramid of learning or something like that, and essentially like a, a stand up presentation where someone's at the front of the room talking to you, you retain about five percent of the information, whereas mm -hmm. if you're actually teaching hands on teaching something to somebody else, you're retaining about ninety percent of the information. And so it's mm -hmm. just it's like a twenty time improvement in the in the amount of retention of information that you're having by teaching people so set yourself up in a circumstance where you can start teaching each other yeah i think the one person understands that you're always the teacher and always the student simultaneously there's something mm -hmm. that every person including yourself has uh, to learn from each other person on this earth many things actually and to deny that fact is ignorant because you're just, you know, limiting your ability to learn certain things that you can do. Yeah. yeah so I, I just got a lot of little nuggets there, but uh, I don't know. Did that answer your question, Kurt? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's, it's a broad question, I guess. But yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I I guess you know, with you being in Acapulco, there, we can talk about the tragic thing that happened with John. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, well, I, 
I can I can certainly say that uh, it's really a tragic situation mm. that is you know kind of intertwined with a whole bunch of stupidity you know on on a, on a lot of people's parts unfortunately okay but, but uh, you know I I guess the the thing that I've been thinking about over the past few days in regard to having to deal with this situation is is that uh, you know, there's there is a there is a cost to freedom, and mm. that is realization that we have a responsibility. You know, and where those responsibilities lie, especially to ourselves and others, are something that we really need to pay attention to. Because I I think if we don't pay attention to them, we end up with a situation like we've got. You know, mm. where one that really was a valuable asset, someone that had some really wonderful strengths, essentially is no longer available to us to help us to, to you know, be an inspiration, to do good things. And, and that, you know, that's a tragedy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we also need to know that, uh, you know, there is, there's another day and we can be better. And, and all we really have is the now. Just got to take what we take, what's happened, learn and get the most from it that we can and move forward better, you know, knowing what we know, learning what we've learned from this, you know, huge mistake. Yeah. I want to say for the record that I'm just, you know, it's always sad to just see somebody and they, uh, a close community member uh, go down no matter what the circumstances. So, you know, we're all just, uh, Really, uh, you know, upset that it happened. You know, it, it to me, you know, whatever whatever the reasons were, uh, I'm just not a fan of uh, you know murderous death in any way. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. bad. So uh, you know, it hit me pretty hard when I heard the news. Um, yeah, it's it, it's there's definitely been better pieces of information I've gotten. Um, <laughs> Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's pre pretty tough. Um, of course, this has raised a, a lot of questions about how safe it is in Acapulco. And well, I, I think it, a lot of people going to Acapulco, I think it is important that people know that Acapulco isn't the safest place in the world. Like you have to be aware of the risks. But of course, you, Michael, you've you've had a very good experience there. What do you have to say about that? Certainly, like Acapulco and me, are, are like Jadel, we're like in complete harmony, you know. So I, I I really love I love Acapulco, but I it's something that uh, you know may not be for everybody, but yeah. uh, people that understand and, and want to really they want to make the most of their life. They want to live. They want to interact with people. You know, there's there's something about a place that, that that represents danger, that also represents a desire to live every day as best you can. You know, hmm. I think that's kind of the thing that that really appeals to me about Acapulco is that you know there there is some sad stories here, hmm. but there's also a fun of you know, amazing stories of of people doing things, you know, living lives, enjoying themselves, enjoying the people around them. Certainly Mexicans, you know, they love their families. And, you know, these are some of the happiest people on the planet. And they they do it with so very little. It mm. should just should just be inspiring. And, and that's kind of the thing that I'm appealing to the the, our larger community is, is, you know, we can bring technology, we can bring new ideas to a community like this, you know, we can like let them loose on, you know, instead of working on something that pays you, uh, you know, a hundred pesos a day, you know, to, to uh, do something. What if, you know, instead of, you know, they work hard for that hundred pesos, what if we show them something that's worth 5,000 pesos a day? You know? mm. And they're willing to work just as hard to do that. Yeah, that's the 
opportunity that, that Acapulco has, I think. And, and that's kind of one of the things that I want to show people about this place that makes it, you know, uh, fertile ground for everything that we're talking about as far as how do we change the world. We show the world. We, we set expectations. And then we deliver, you know, and I, I, I really think when it comes to delivering uh, Acapulcanos and, and, and Mexicans that, in a larger general sense, they deliver, man. They work hard and uh, they make it happen and they enjoy life too. Yeah, and I wanted to say something too about um, people's perpetual fear of Acapulco being a dangerous city. Um, I live in, Port like I said before, I live in Portland, Oregon. and. I love living there. I feel completely safe there. But despite that, I hear gunshots on the weekly. It used to be on the daily, but it's on the weekly now. I, every single day I go out, I see homeless people on the street. Okay. Well, I was here for a month last year in Acapulco. And the whole month I was here, I did not hear one gunshot. Not one. And I didn't see any homeless people anywhere. Yo, there were plenty of fireworks. But there was a different gunshot. But, you know, like, there were lots of fireworks. No gunshots. A lot of a lot of positive energy and attitudes. From all the locals toward me as somebody who's an outsider. You know, I feel like the the tourists here are treated very well. The the economy here is very dependent upon tourism, and uh, they've been suffering uh, on that end for a long time. So that when tourists do come here, they're very nice to us. You know, there there's no reason for them to get mad at, at you unless you give them a reason to get mad at you. It's just using common sense. Anytime you go anywhere. And this is true not just for Acapulco, but any major U.S. city. Don't do anything stupid. Don't go out and attack people and steal from people, and you'll be fine. You know, it's just like anything. Like you'd ask of anyone else anywhere else, but they're asking you. Just don't, you know, don't do us wrong, basically. And you know, if you go to Detroit, uh, Chicago, Washington D.C., L.A. I mean, I could name a whole bunch of other U.S. cities. All of those cities are much, much more dangerous. Than Acapulco. Detroit is another one. Like, I mean, so, you know, people say, oh, I'm afraid of Acapulco because of what they hear in the media, but really it's just the media smearing Acapulco. You know, I mean, they, there's plenty of US cities that are much more violent and dangerous than here, much more by a lot. And, uh, yes. you know, and, they're, and I guarantee you the mainstream media is going to use the situation down here to further smear the area into making people scared of it to not come down here. And not only just the area, but also the conferences that go on down here, the Anarchy conferences during February, which is unfortunate, but that's how the mainstream media does. Yeah. yeah well, I, I will mention that, you know, there is some other things to consider. And that is how, how the Republicans look at us, you know, as tourists and as, as anarchists and as, you know, kind of foreigners in their land. For the most part, they, you know, they, they are open armed to us. When we get that kind of offer, we also have to have enough respect for them to like play by their rules exactly. yep. and, and, and recognize, you know, their culture and, and what their values are and stuff like that. You know, uh, I, I don't know if it was you that I was talking to, but we were talking about the, you know, the difference in the culture between like the American and, and, and pretty much the anarchist point of view of like individualism versus how the Mexicans go about doing it, you know, which is, is you know, the family is their, is their, their, you know, their heart. That's why you don't see homeless people down here, really, yeah. you know. But but you know there is a, there is like a there is a harmonious mix that can be had if we respect both sides if we respect the individual and we respect the group you know right and I, there is a, a nice mix that really gets things working and I think you know that's another thing that Acapulco brings and I I, I think anarchists could learn from is that you know, working together. The Mexicans demonstrate that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm of the mindset that I'm going to, I'm going to give this information to the anarchists, and I'm also going to give this information to the, the Mexican, and I'm going to see which one does the best with it. You know, so like the anarchists can take it and run with it, or the Mexicans can run and take with, it, take it and run with it. And I would say honestly, I think the Mexicans have got the edge. 
<laughs> right. Well, you know, there's one thing I love about Mexico. There's many things I love, but one thing is their resourcefulness. So, you know, this word that they have, Mexicanada, you know that word? I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar with it. Okay. It's, it's sort of like saying jury rig. It's like when you come up with something that's that's a bit of a funny solution, but it's it, it's a solution that works. So like you don't, might not have a lot of resources on hand. Maybe you don't have a pipe, so you make one out of a bunch of Coke bottles or something like that. So, <laughs> so you know, people are always willing to use whatever they have and, and come up with a solution any way that they can. They will, they will do it. <laughs> and that's also... I, I never really worried in Mexico, like, I, I guess at a point where I, I was thinking maybe the dollar's going to collapse or, you know, society's going to collapse or something like that. I didn't worry too much in Mexico because I knew if something happened, supply lines get cut off, there would be somebody out there riding a tricycle to get tortillas to people or <laughs> to get water to people or whatever. Because people do look for opportunities there. Yeah, it, it, it's just never ending how much effort and passion the people here have towards like making your life pleasurable and, and enjoyable and happy. You know, they're, mm. they're genuinely interested in trying to, you know, keep you happy. And that's a hell of an attitude to apply to your life, you know, and, and that's, that's certainly something that, uh, you know, like this uh, Anarchapoco bringing people down and, you know, and being a host of a couple parties is something that I want to bring to the awareness, you know, to, to other people that when you come down to Acapulco, this is about, you know, this uh, is about enjoying the good things in life, enjoying the good things that we bring to each other mm. and, and, you know, and having a good time doing it, you know, and, and uh, this is like, I was saying that like my, uh, the Anarchapoco pre-party is like the official moment when I have this smile on my face that just doesn't end until sometime in March. Because I'm just, <laughs> you know, Nirvana here with all, you know, all these people that I love to, to interact with. And then, you know, I'm in the place that I love to be in. You know? So I just love showing them all the neat things around here. And there's just a never-ending supply of good stuff. <laughs> yeah wonderful uh yeah we could finish up there and if, uh, do you have anything else to say i, I can show them the track steam up shirts i brought a couple of those too is this for steam it this video i'm just curious um, i'll put it on steam and i'll put it on youtube and uh, a couple other One places second. yeah okay sure yeah so well i guess i could say something about uh you know this this all came about because i was uh i was trying to write a book and the uh, the initial book I was trying to write was essentially about, you know, how to, how to get into an octolog, mm. but it, it's really transformed into something else entirely. I, I think it, it will demonstrate the value of an octolog, but it's really about like creating a, a larger awareness about what is valuable in, in ourselves and the people around us you know, mm. identify. So just for the audience, if the audience doesn't know what an octolog is, it's a group of eight people who get to de together to discuss things and every decision is made by consensus. And there's also a kind of group hypnosis session that's involved. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's kind of an advanced uh, segment that uh -huh. Bob Podolsky is, is uh, you know, he's kind of the innovator of that. I, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of an area that, that it kind of draws away from like what we're trying to do. It, it's certainly like an advanced step that when people okay. get to the point that they're really in a trusting environment can do mm -hmm. up until the point that you don't, you don't have enough trust to like, to really like share an environment that's really conducive to creativity. It's really not going to be that helpful, you know. So, you know, it is really about getting people to recognize the value of themselves and, and doing that through things like, you know, teaching other people and so forth. So, these are the Tribe Team Up shirts. Let's see if you can see them on the video there. Boom. All right, cool. 
And we got the, uh, that was the second place design from our logo contest. And this is the first place design. And if you look on my uh, blog too, I have a post, uh, the, the second most recent post is uh, another uh, post about the Anarcha Poco shirts. And there's just a huge <laughs> list of links on that post to all my other uh, t-shirt link projects or projects. Right. Links to all my t-shirts. And in the description. Yeah, this one was dyed with, uh, these are all herbal dyed by the way, with plants. So this one was dyed with uh, the innards of the cut tree that's created the brown. Wow. And then next, th this one was uh, dyed with blackberries that we collected locally ourselves. Huh. And this color, this gold color, was actually created with this from the same plant of the blackberries. The blackberry leaves, shoots, and uh, canes and pods. It created. Huh. Wow. So yeah, and we yeah. all collected that. So, and that is one of the things about herbal dyeing that's like really important. I was going to mention the brochure we're making on a lot of the herbal dyeing companies, like they, they spend a lot of energy resources and fuel and water creating those herbal dyes. So it actually makes using them not as eco-friendly as it could be. So if you collect all the stuff yourself though, and make your own dye concentrates with the plants, and you also do it in a way where you're selectively taking from the plants. So you're not you're not hurting or killing the plants, but actually helping the development of the plants by taking from them by pruning it correctly to encourage growth in other areas to make it more healthy. Wow. Um, that's what we go for with all this stuff. We're trying to make we're trying to spread wisdom of the most eco conscious practices possible and let people know like you can do this and here's how and our wisdom is free. So the more people that start doing stuff like this, the better world we're going to live in. That's kind of the message we're trying to provide here. Can, can people order those T-shirts from you? From from uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I actually have them up. I actually have them up on our uh, online store with the Homesteaders Co-op. Um, hmm. One of our buddies on Steemit created this uh, awesome website for uh, for conscious uh, products um, that are handmade. Um, called yeah, it's called the Homesteaders Co-op. It's made by a group of Steemians, and uh, they they're providing this space for people who make these kind of things for free. Um, so there's no like fees or anything for selling your products on there and you can ship worldwide and also not only accept PayPal, but, uh, Steam and STD as well on the website. Um, mm -hmm. I, I currently have it down cause I'm down here out of the country. Um, but, uh, yeah, when I get back from Acapulco, it'll be back up and running and I'll have the Steam Silver Rounds on there, the Trap Steam Up shirts. If I have any Acapulco shirts left over, maybe some of those and uh, a few other products we have coming in too. Awesome. And Michael, how can people sign up for your workshop? Uh, I think they'll be able to find that on uh, on the Anarchapoco uh, website. Actually, I, I didn't even get a chance to talk about what I'm doing for my workshop. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was planning on doing something called the Declaration of Expectation, which is essentially, uh, you know, this kind of four-step method or an introduction to that, as well as kind of uh, introducing people to the idea of, like, identifying the skills and, and abilities of each other, and then applying that to problems, identifying problems, and then just kind of like, uh, you know, like creating uh, uh, solutions and then like making a statement about what to expect in the coming year about these skills and abilities we have applied to the problems that we can identify that we think we can solve. <laughs> and just kind of setting an expectation for not only the rest of the community, but for the rest of the world to, to, to really see, hey, you know, we, we have the intention of changing the world for the better. And just to give you an indication, we're going to give you some of these things that we're working on to gain your trust. You know? But that, that one actually got uh, canceled. And so uh, I was, I've got another one, what I, what I call great anarchist experiment. And just... We're going to essentially do four experiments over a two-hour period uh, where people learn a lot more about themselves and learn about the other people around them and, and what kind of things that we can do through an experiment to actually show that, hey, you know, we can talk to each other. We can do stuff together. We can establish beneficial rules that we can all abide by that can make the world a better place, you know? And so it, it does involve uh, maybe putting together some rules 
and I consider rules to be like the, the seeds of either good or bad habits. And so if a rule is good, it'll end up turning into a good habit and you know have beneficial outcomes versus if a rule is bad, it turns into a bad habit and you know takes away. And so uh, by really establishing rules, we're just starting down the path of, of demonstrating you know what we can do for each other in regard to things that are good and are beneficial to everybody else or bad. I think I can do that in two hours and, and make it a fun and exciting environment that I think is going to be very beneficial for everybody that comes. And, uh, and that will be on the anarchopocalypse.com site that I think you can uh, connect with. I'm not sure if it's there at the moment, but it should be there in the next day or two or a couple of days. Okay, great. Well, yeah, send me the link as soon as you get it. I'll put it in the description. I'll get the link to the, for my online store, too. It's called Elemental Earth on the Home Series Co-op. It's kind of a long address, so I'll give it to you. Okay. Yeah, cool. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for the for the chat, and uh, I hope everything goes great. And Acapulco, break a leg with your with your performances there, Elemental. And yeah, have a lot of fun. Collaborate <laughs> uh, on some music projects in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah I'd love to. You're, you're, what's the what's the time frame on your situation with Mexico? You're you're essentially banned from Mexico until until July this year. So, oh, okay. uh, I, yeah, it's not so far away. I'm kind of counting down the months. <laughs> well, is that your intention to be back in July then? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'll probably be back in Guadalajara in July. And I hope to travel around Mexico a lot more because there's still so much I haven't seen, especially in the south, like in Chiapas and yeah, everything down there. <laughs> yeah. If you need a staging ground or a place to stay, you know, you always got one. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, that's very kind. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to check the links to hear Elemental's music and his T-shirts. Buy his T-shirts and check out Michael's workshop if you're going to Anarchapulco. Thanks so much. Take it easy.